Praise the Lord, everyone. Hello, everybody out there in, in, uh, in your homes today. Yeah, I'm so glad to have the chance to be with you again to talk about the Word of God. What I want to do before we start anything, wherever you are, whether you're sitting at home, whether you're in your kitchen, your living room, wherever you may be, if you could just close your eyes right now and let's just pray for a moment together. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that no matter where we may be, no matter how our, our church may be scattered in the various houses today, that we can feel the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I feel your presence right now. Lord, I feel the touch and the power of God. Lord, we're going to spend a few moments studying the Word of God together, and I pray that in every home where people are gathered together, let the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost touch them today. Let your presence move in a mighty way. We don't want just to hear this Word and then go on about our normal daily routine with no change, but let the Word of God change us and touch us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I, I feel the presence of God already. I, I'm standing in, in our church today, and there's only a couple of people here, but I still feel the presence and the power of God, and I hope that in your home, wherever you are, that you can feel the same thing. Today I want to I want to teach for a few minutes on a subject that that's been just kind of burning in my soul and and uh, I just I just have to share this today. I it seems like everywhere you go, every every radio station that you turn on, if you're driving in your car, every time you listen to the news, everything is about the coronavirus, and it's it's having a huge impact on our economy, on people's lives. There's millions of people have lost their jobs. And, and I'm sure there's people listening today that you have are going through difficult times and uncertain times. This is a time where many people are suffering. And, and we've read about the thousands of people that have been sick and the, the, the orders that have gone out to shelter in place and stay at home and and I don't know about you, but, you know, staying at home, you can go stir crazy after a while. You, just, you want to get out. But, but to stay at home so as not to spread the virus and to only go out for essential activities and, and to limit businesses and so on only to those that are essential and to practice social distancing, to stay away from people. You know, in the church, we, we like to shake hands and we like to hug one another and not supposed to do that, supposed to keep your distance. And instead of gathering together to worship, we're all at our homes. And it can feel kind of like we're, we're, we're separated from one another, like we're on our own. And, and it's, it's like this, you know, we can't gather together and there's something in our heart that misses the opportunity to get together. And, and I can't. I didn't have time to show you a picture about what I'm seeing, but if you can imagine, I, I, I'm teaching to an empty building. Got a couple people here on sound and, and, and pastors here in the building, but for the most part, it's empty. And it can seem like that as the body of Christ, the church of God, that, that we, we, how can we fulfill what we are called to do when we cannot gather together, when we're isolated in our homes, when we have to be socially distanced from other people. It can get to the point where, you know, we're just kind of biding time, just kind of letting things happen, just kind of going through the, through the routine, kind of put everything on pause, including my walk with God or including what God has called me to do while this goes on, until finally we're hoping, you know, I'm, I'm just going to wait until this situation has passed. But church has never, ever been about the building. Church is not about the four walls and the doors and the fans and the sound system and the, the pulpit and, and, and the instruments. Church is not about that. Church is about people. It's about those that on a normal Sunday would gather together to lift up our hands and worship God. Church is about coming together to magnify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you were to read throughout history, you would find that the church has survived persecution many, many times. You would find, you could read throughout from the very beginning of how 
saints and men and women of God were persecuted for their beliefs, that they were many times that they were killed by lions or they were burned at the stake or they hid in catacombs and thousands upon thousands died. Even in the Bible, if you were to read Acts chapters 6, 7, and 8, you would read the story of the stoning of Stephen, who was a man of God, who, who preached under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, who, who believed and, and did what was right. If I'm just going to read one, one verse from this story in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. It says, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And what happened is Stephen, had, he had preached the word and they, they take, took him and they, they stoned him to death. This picture that I'm showing is, is supposed to represent the stoning of Stephen. The end result was that the church was scattered and there broke out a great revival. You, you can read throughout not only the Bible, but throughout history. And even this was two reports that I, I picked off of a website of recently where it talks about that every day, every single day, there are at least four Christians in Nigeria that die for their faith in Jesus Christ. Every single day. There's a, I read another story of a Chinese pastor who talked about the hundreds of police had raided their church. And when, and when I'm talking about a church, I'm not talking about a big building. I'm talking about a home where some people had gathered together and desired to do the will and the work of God. And the police had descended upon them and, and many were beaten and many were taken to prison. And yet the pastor said, and at the very end of his, he, had, he described the entire circumstance. And at the end, he said, but yet revival continues. We as a church in the United States of America are not facing persecution. We're taking steps to protect ourselves so as not to be sick. Taking steps to protect ourselves so as not to come in contact with the virus or to spread it to others or to spread it to others that may be more susceptible. But because of these steps, we're separated and we're in our different homes. I'm here to tell you that that does not mean that the church has to go on pause and stop everything and, and no, no more growth. We're just going to kind of wait it out. In the midst of this, you can still have revival. I was reading a report uh, from another church where the pastor had got on and preached a sermon and, and some people that were listening felt convicted in their heart. They came to the church and they baptized them. They had just listened online and their life was changed and were baptized in the precious name of Jesus. Why? Because there's power in the word of God. And it's not dependent upon a building. It's dependent upon people that I love God and serve God and can continue to do what God has called them to do. The church has survived many wars, and we could go through many stories at different times where different churches have struggled. I, I had one example that I had studied a while back of, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he was known, his staunch resistance to the Nazi regime, regime and, and dictatorship, including vocal opposition to Hitler's euthanasia program. And he was against the genocidal program, and he stood up and he voiced that. And you know what? For that, ultimately, he died for his beliefs. There have been, if you were to read throughout history, this has happened over and over again. But yet, the church has always survived. If you could read, there are many examples of the church that survived attacks from within were false doctrines. You can, even at the very beginning of the church, there were people that, that rose up to teach false ideas and false doctrines. But yet the truth of the word of God always survived. I'm here to tell you today, though, that God never designed the church to survive. He did not design it just to survive, the church was designed to thrive. It was designed to grow. It was designed to become greater. It was designed to be victorious. I don't read the Bible and see at the end of time that there's going to be a few people that just barely make it into heaven. There is going to be a victorious church. There is going to be a victorious group of people that are going to make it to heaven. 
And when I and I look at this whole situation, and I I don't have Bible for this. This is just Nathan Boyd's opinion. But I feel like this is like preparation for the last days. This is preparation. You've got to learn to serve God without being able to gather together. You've got to learn to feel the presence of God at home without having the benefit of the music and the lights and everything else that God has blessed us with and is wonderful. And hopefully soon we'll be able to gather back together and, and be able to hear the praises and the singing and the music and feel the anointing. But you've got to still, while we don't have that, you've got to learn to feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost in your home. You've got to be able to put on the music and be be able to lift your hands and feel the presence of God. You got to be able to pray and, and get in touch with God in your home. This is a time that God can prepare us for the work of God. The coronavirus and, and, and I showed this picture last week. Yes, it's kind of separated us, but I feel like God has a purpose and a plan in all of this. So if you think of this, because of the coronavirus, we're unable to gather together to worship. You can't come in here and here today and, and worship and, and, and praise God with people around you. We're kind of told to remain in our homes. We have to take refuge and, and, and stay where we are and, and minimize our interaction with people. We have to survive, in other words. We have to keep living but yet do the very minimum possible. I'm here to tell you that as the church of God, I have no intention of just surviving. My plan is to thrive. My plan is to live for God and to thrive in the presence of God. We are preparing, as I said for a few minutes ago, at, for the end of times, and we are preparing to have a victorious church. God it will have a victorious and a mighty church. And what I want to do for the next few minutes... I've got a little less than a half an hour to talk to you about the Word of God. Is I want to talk to you about how from your home, from your house, even when you're not able to gather together, while, while you're listening to me and you, and you know all, all the different saints and, and members of the, the same body, that they're all listening at the same time. What can we do to ensure that we have a victorious walk with God? How can we live our faith, live what we believe to make sure that we have a victorious walk with God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship. God has created us and made us to be what we are. We were created in Christ Jesus on two good works. He created us to do the work of the kingdom of God which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, what this verse is saying is God created you. He created me. He created all of us. He created us with a plan. He created us to walk in good works before we ever even knew about them or before we existed. God had a plan that we should walk in him and in those works that God created. Christianity, it's not about the band and the lights and the sound system. Them. It's about Jesus. Everything that we do and what, how we live, it's about Jesus. So as I said a minute ago, how can I thrive from home? How can I thrive in this kind of environment? And, and, and I know in uh, last Wednesday and a few other times, we, we've had some discussions about how, how am I to deal spiritually with the current situation. But there's just a few other things, and I, I, I'm not trying to... Oh, get you to forget those things. Those are all important, but there's just a few other things that kind of link up with those that struck me in my mind that I feel like are important. First of all, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20 says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. When you get together, and together might just be you and your spouse, Maybe it's just you and somebody on the telephone. Maybe it's your family. When you get together and begin to pray, sometimes we, we know this in our mind, but we forget the reality that God's presence is there with you. 
God's presence is there. And, and, and when you begin to pray, there's no reason that you just got to kind of go through the motions and, and say a normal prayer and, and that's it. It's over. The next time when, when it's time to, to pray at your home, I want you to begin to pray with fervency and, and begin to pray with Belief that God's presence can fill your house. Belief that God's power and God's anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost can begin to touch you and and begin to touch your children and begin to touch your spouse. And and this really struck me. Please don't think for even a moment that I've got this all figured out. But one thing I have realized is if we can't come together, and, and begin to feel the presence of God as we worship together. And let's say we don't get to have church together for several weeks. Are you going to go weeks without feeling the presence of God? Are you going to go weeks without feeling the touch of God? I don't think anybody that's listening to this message today, that you want to go weeks and weeks and weeks and not feel the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We have got to get beyond saying, do you know what? I, I, I did my, my, my 10 minutes of prayer today. No, we have got to pray until the power of God fills our homes. We've got to pray until the anointing and the Holy Ghost begins to fill your home. There can be people that get the Holy Ghost in your home. You don't have to be at church. It can be even there. I, you know, I can't wait until we can come back together and worship God. But until that happens, don't think for a moment that God's presence is not right where you are. And we have to pray with such belief and power. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken. This was just a home. This wasn't a, fa- a fancy temple or a sanctuary. They got together. They were being persecuted. And, and again, we're not facing persecution right now. But you know what? We're separated from one another. But just like Acts chapter 4, you can get together with your family and you be- can begin to pray. And when you begin to pray fervently expecting and looking for the presence and the power of God, it can fill your home. It can fill your life. And the anointing can fill your place and it can change your family. Now you might say, well, what are we supposed to pray for? I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and for those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives and in all godliness and holiness. You ought to pray for your leaders. It doesn't matter to me whether you like President Trump or don't like President Trump. He has to make decisions. You ought to be praying, God, give him wisdom. There are people around him as Vice President Pence and there are other doctors and so on that are trying to make decisions and this situation. There are governors in in every state that have to make important decisions that affect what we can do on a day-to-day basis. You ought to get on your face and pray, God, give them wisdom. They may or may not be in my particular political bent, but God be with them. You said that you put people in power and you take them down. So whoever's in power, God has put them there. And now, Lord, give them wisdom. That ought to be part of your prayers. James chapter 5 verse 15 says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. In other words, we we ought to pray for the hurting. There are a lot of people that are sick. There are those that are suffering because of job loss or unemployment or different situations that have affected them. You may know people that that are suffering. You ought to pray for them. God, be with them, provide for them, touch them. These are all things that you can pray and can make a difference because when the people of God pray, something happens. We, we, we think I'm just saying words. You're not just saying words. When you pray, something happens happens. Something in the realm of the Spirit happens. When you begin to worship and then you come before the very throne room of God and begin to pray, there is things that will change forever. You know, in in Acts chapter 3, verse 6, Peter and and, and, and John were on the way to the temple and they saw a man that was sick 
and ask them for alms. And verse 6 that I have on here says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And you know the story. He reached out and took his hand and lifted him up, and he was healed. He took a step of faith. Now, you can't go out and hug people and lay your hands on them and all the things that you might normally like to do because you're supposed to practice social distancing. But you know what? You can pick up the phone. A lot of people at home right now. And, and, and of course, you're, I'm talking about your family, uh, of, you know, of, of your church family. But more than that, there's a lot of your neighbors. There's a lot of coworkers. They're all home right now. Why don't you call them on your cell phone? Why don't you begin to talk to them? And if in the midst of that conversation they say, you know what, I'm just feeling, like, you know, I'm, I'm feeling down or maybe I'm struggling with this. Why don't you just stop and say, do you know what, I believe God can change things. And right on the phone, why don't you pray believing that God will do a miracle in their life? This might be the opportunity for you to be able to pray with them and they see the miraculous power of God that they never saw before. There's an opportunity to pray like we've never had before. Another thing that I believe that you can do to make sure that you ex ex thrive is to live a life of worship. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7 says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. In other words, you ought to be talking about God all the time. And I, and, and I know. I know for those that have small children and they're all home and you're trying to homeschool and you're trying to keep the house clean because there's kids around and you're trying to stay organized and you're trying to keep your sanity. I know. I understand. I have kids. I, and I get it. And it can be frustrating and it can be difficult and it can be stressful. But in the midst of this, you have an opportunity that you may not get again. Every day to be able to spend some time with them and talk to them about Jesus. And worship, we think often of just, you know, lifting our hands and praising God. What you ought to do, your kids ought to see you worship at home. And they ought to see you pray at home. And, and, I, and I, for one, I'm standing here thinking, you know what? I got to do a better job today than this. Well, our family today, we met and talked and prayed a little bit this morning. And, 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 and in my heart, I'm thinking, I got to do more of this because you know what? This is a chance. I want my kids to see that even if we can't go to church, that my beliefs are not just because of church. My beliefs are because I founded my life upon it. If we can't be in church, then we're going to have church at home and, and we're going to pray and, and we're going to read the Bible together. And, and, and I'm going to tell them that Jesus is real and, and I'm going to tell them that there's one God, and, and I'm going to tell them that he can heal, and I'm going to tell them that God cares about them. This is part of what we live and believe, and our life at home ought to be a life of worship. John chapter 5, verse 39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. This is a chance. I, I, I know many parents are you're probably busier than you've ever been trying to balance everything. But you know what? Don't forget to take the time to read the Word of God. How are you going to know how to live if you're not searching the Scriptures? And don't, and not just you. Well, this is your chance to study the Word of God and read the Word of God. But you know, we are blessed with technology like no other generation ever had. You're hearing me today because of Facebook Live or YouTube or however you're listening we never had this in the past. We have ways to share the gospel like never before. There are programs like, like Zoom, for those of you that haven't used it, where you can connect with people. Do you know what? People are stuck at home and bored. What better time to call them up and ask them, hey, you want to get together over Zoom and have a Bible study? You, you might have been thinking for the last few months, oh, you know, I'd like to teach a home Bible study. Why not now? Because there's a lot of people stuck at home that, needs, that don't have a lot to do. This might be the opportunity. If you were having a home Bible study, you don't need to stop. There's enough technology and tools out there that you can keep on teaching. It might be on Zoom. It might be over line. But you know what? It's possible. My workplace, I'm currently working from home. And, and to meet with my staff, I, we, we, 
person I mentioned Zoomed a few times. That's because that's the program that we use. We get together on Zoom. We have meetings. We can see each other. We can talk about it and plan things. There's no difference. The church of God can do the same thing. You can change somebody's life forever by spending time on the Word of God. Now, not only should we share the Word of God, but in a time when a lot of people can get depressed because the market goes down, you know, those of you that have a retirement income, don't look at it because it'll make you very depressed. If you've got investments, it's best just don't, don't look right now. And, and there can be a lot of people that can get really depressed and really down. And, and uh, there's a lot of people, those that have their own businesses that are really going to struggle because they can't be open right now. And there can be a tendency to, to kind of get negative. And focus on negative, but, but Romans chapter 15, verse 13, not that, I, not that we should ignore the situation, but still in the midst of the situation. It says, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you can abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. In the midst of the most depressing situation or you might be really struggling and maybe the future seems very uncertain for you right now. Can I tell you that God can bring joy and hope in the midst of struggle by the power of the Holy Ghost. You can be sitting at home saying, I don't know what I'm going to do next, but God knows the future. He knows what's happening, and you can have hope. I believe that, you know what, we're going to come out of this, and things are going to be better than they were before, and, and I believe there's going to be there's going to be more power, and the church is going to be more on fire, and, and there can be hope that can build in your heart. Don't let yourself get depressed because of what looks like right now. Understand that, yes, I'm going through this situation, but I'm going through and I'm going to come out on the other side. And God is going to be in control. The most important thing that kind of summarizes this this all up is in the midst of darkness and in the midst of difficult times, the church is to arise and let the light shine. There has never been a time or, or a reason that the church should just kind of fade into the shadows. We ought always in difficult times to be the light, to be the example, to be the source of hope, to be the source of truth. God has called us always to stand up. There is no reason reason or no excuse for any child of God to try to hide. But in the midst of trouble and tribulation, it ought to be the church that stands up and declares there will be hope. There ought to be the church that stands up and declares that there will be truth and that there is still a God that's in control. The last thing that you can do, and I know sometimes this this might be Difficult, and you have to use your imagination and, and maybe do things differently than you normally would do. But Matthew chapter 23, verse 11 says, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. In other words, as Christians, we are called to serve. We are called to do the work of God. And it, many of it, you that are listening have, were in the military or were involved in the military. And many veterans that I have talked to have told me, you know, it was, it was an honor to serve. It was an honor to contribute to my country. It was an honor to give. We ought to have that same attitude when it comes to the kingdom of God. It is an honor to serve the kingdom of God. It's an honor to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is my almighty. He is the everlasting one. It is an honor to serve the kingdom of God. And I, you know, I know you can't go out and do everything, but if you know someone struggling financially, maybe you can get some groceries and they just drop them at their door. Or maybe just a call to, to try to cheer someone up. Or, or maybe be a call to pray with someone or find some way that you can contribute, that you can serve. I, I really believe that, you know, in a our country as a whole is suffering right now. And it ought to be Christians that stand up and not cause problems, but it ought to be Christians that stand up and be a source of hope, a source of service, a source of someone that says, you know what, I don't know what I can do, but whatever I can find my hand to do, I will step up and I will contribute. 
I will give what I can. I'll help whom I can. I'll be the hope for whom I can. I will be the one that will try to do my best to be there when others need me. I really believe that this can be the moment that changes the world. If the church, and when I'm saying the church, I'm not just talking about open door. I'm talking about the church as a whole. If we will rise to the challenge. In Acts chapter 17, verse 6, there were some people that said, those that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. I I just, the the, the main thought and the last thing that I I, I want you to get out of this lesson and and the last thing that I I, I don't want you to forget, I I want you to, uh, throughout the day, I want you to think about this is in this time, when you're kind of limited to what, how far and how much traveling you can do, and, and this time when there's fewer people out, how can you rise up and make a difference and make sure that your neighbors and make sure that your community, make sure they know that you are a part of the church of the living God, that you will be bring hope and that you will bring joy and if they need you you're going to pray with them and and you're going to believe that God will do a miracle and and if they need someone that can pray that they know to turn to you that you're the one that knows how to get a hold of God and, and you're the one that has a touch with God your neighbors ought to know that there's anybody around me that knows how to pray it's those people in that house and if I really need someone I'm going to go to them and I know they'll pray and I know something will happen I, I don't want to, at the end of this, weeks from now, when, when things have kind of cleared up and, and we go back to kind of our normal routine, at some time that's going to happen. I know right now that we don't have a time frame, and that makes a lot of people nervous in and of itself when, I don't know when things are going to be normal. Well, I don't know when no things are going to be normal either. But when that does happen, when this kind of, fades away. This is not the first time there's been a pandemic. There have been many in the past and there will be more in the future. But when this fades away and things get back to normal and everyone's back in their normal routine and we're gathering together, I I, I don't want to look back and say, you know what? That period during that pandemic, that, that, that that was a low time. I want to look back and say, do you know what? I have some great memories of of the power of God moving in my home. That was the time that I finally was able to tell, talk to my neighbor about Jesus Christ. That was the time where I finally had the the, the bravery, the the you know wasn't so nervous that I was able to pray with my neighbor on the phone. That was the time that God changed my life forever. I heard someone say, I don't even remember who it was now, but I, I remember them saying. It might have even been on the radio, I'm not sure. That during this period of time, there will be businesses that will go out of business. And then there will be businesses that thrive. There will be churches that this will cause them to close their doors forever. And then there will be churches that have great revival. I don't know about you. But I want to be the church that has great revival. I want to be part of the kingdom of God. I'm not going to let the situation try to to hold us back. We got to move forward, step forward. Let the power of the presence of God fill your home. And and, and I'm coming to a close, but I just am so passionate in my heart this, this afternoon that I want you to realize that even if you're home, that God's power can touch you there and the anointing of God can touch if there's someone in your family that hasn't yet received the gift of the Holy Ghost there is no reason while you're sitting at home that you can't lay your hands on them and begin to pray and they be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost there's no reason if you got if if you're not feeling well or you're not feeling sick we're not some of those crazy TV evangelists that are going to tell you send me a hundred thousand dollars and we'll pray no Get your person sitting beside you to lay their hand on you and begin to pray in the name of Jesus and God can heal them today, right now, right in your home. The power of God can move. Amen. I hope you believe it and I hope you can become part of those that have turned the world upside down. I'm going to pray as I close here today. 
please stay online. We're going to take a few minutes of break. It's about probably about 15 minutes, I guess. About 15 minute break here. And then pastor's going to come on and preach. You don't want to miss that. Make sure you go grab some snacks or go to the, you know, that's one thing you can do at home. You can't do in church. You can go get some snacks. Go, go do whatever you need to do, then come back, 3 o'clock, right on the dot, 3 o'clock. We're going to start um, the, the next service, and, and I believe that God's going to speak to you. Amen. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing right now, let's all close our eyes just for a moment. Just take another brief pause. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, God, for your word. And, Lord, you've, you've put this thought in my mind as this burning passion to see the presence of God move in our lives. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you, whoever's listening today, wherever they may be, whatever state, whatever city they may be in, I pray, God, even those that may listen to the recording later on, let the word of God touch them and let the faith arise and to believe that God can use them in this time and in this day to do great things for the kingdom of God. I pray that you continue to move amongst your people. And Lord, even at home, let them feel your presence. And I just pray, God, in a few moments when we gather together to hear the preaching of the word of God from Pastor, that that word would touch every heart, that it would draw us closer to you. Thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I made I was breathing But not Alive All my failures I tried To hide It was my dream yeah. Till I You call